Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where, as I'm sure you've noticed, in television, what's old is new again, right? Will and Grace is back, Roseanne is back, Murphy Brown is coming back uh, the next television season. But the question is, can this new trend work in movies as well? It turned out pretty darn good for bringing back the Jurassic Park franchise, right? But what about smaller cult hits like Bill and Ted? Well, we're about to find out because Bill and Ted 3 is finally moving forward with a surprising amount of details. It's interesting. This first story has so much details about the project, perhaps because they're trying to sell it. Uh, and then the second story of the day, Jordan Peele's new film is totally a leap of faith because he is playing it awfully close to the vest. But anyway, we're focusing on Bill and Ted right now. Uh, now, this has been made official because they're shopping it at Cannes, the Cannes Film Festival. Uh, it already has a U.S. distributor, MGM. MGM's not exactly cash rich, though. Uh, so even though it has a U.S. distributor, uh, they still have to get financing by selling the international distribution rights, which they're trying to do so at Cannes. Although this was so hot yesterday when it was announced, it would seem like it would be an easy sell. So it's Bill and Ted 3. They've been talking about this for quite some time. Uh, Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter saying they very much would like to do a third film. But people are always saying, you know, particularly actors, they'd like to do something. But, you know, like, look how often Henry Cavill is saying he'd love to make another Superman movie. Who cares? I'm, and, you know, you always imagine that the producers are like, oh, yeah, sure, Henry, that would be great, right? I felt kind of bad for Henry Cavill where he was like, oh, yeah, I'm talking to people about it. And it's like, but legitimately? Uh, but anyway, this is actually going forward. Uh, it's going to be called Bill and Ted Face the Music, which I think is a very good title. Uh, I only actually have one problem with the way this project is coming together, and I'll tell you about it in just a moment. Uh, but it's going to take place 27 years later, and Bill and Ted are not only, of course, grown-ups, but they have families. Uh, and a time traveler shows up and says, where is the song that you, you know, that, that, you, that you guys uh, write that saves the universe? Only problem is, they still haven't written it because their adult lives have gotten in the way. Uh, now, they have, gave a little bit more context to what's going on with Bill and Ted when we meet them at this stage in their life. And their marriages are falling apart, which I think would be pretty good. I don't want to see shrewish Bill and Ted wives, though. I think that's uh, like a really old, you know, I think stereotypical narrative about wives. But then also, and I think this might be the one misstep, they're going to have their daughters. They're bo they both have daughters, and their daughters are going to join them on this new adventure. And you would think after what happened with Indiana Jones, Hollywood would understand that nobody wants to see the offspring of beloved characters. They just want to see the beloved characters. But, well, you know, hopefully they'll cast them really well. Maybe they'll get, like, a new Aubrey Plaza or somebody who has a really great vibe about her comedically. Uh, but I honestly don't want to give any screen time to daughters instead of Bill and Ted. So the, the, the dialogue between Bill and Ted and their daughters better be worth their inclusion. But maybe it is, because the original creators of Bill and Ted, Chris uh, Matheson and Ed Solomon, that's a name I'm sure more of you are familiar with, uh, they wrote this new script, so it's authentic. It's not somebody else trying to do Bill and Ted. And then Dean Parasot is attached to direct. Dean Parasot, you probably don't know this name, but you certainly are familiar with his work. Very talented comedic director. Galaxy Quest, uh, Red 2, and Fun with Dick and Jane, which is a Jim Carrey T. Leone movie, which was actually really good. Unfortunately, it was uh, a downturn in Jim Carrey's career, and T. Leone has never been able to sell a movie ticket, uh, but it was a very, very good movie. Really hilarious. If you're looking for a strong rental, I recommend it highly. So that seems like, you know, even though I don't like the daughter's uh, inclusion, uh, and also if you're going to get the international rights, you're allowed to read the script. Uh, so then, you know, my, my, my concerns about that would be addressed immediately. So I would invest in this, and I would certainly pay to go and see it. Now, I thought this was interesting. I was looking at the coverage yesterday, and in the comment section, someone wrote, wow, Keanu Reeves needs a new agent for him to do this. That seems ridiculous. You know, this seems like a bad career move. And it's like, yeah, well, first of all, it's a cult favorite. I don't think it's a bad career move at all. I think it's a genius move. I mean, when's the last time Keanu Reeves trended? Uh, probably when something about John Wick came out. And, of course, he's shooting John Wick 3 right now. I tweeted a photo from the set yesterday, and it looks like Chad Stileski, who's stuck with that franchise while um, his co-director on the first one, David Leach, has gone on to much bigger things, but I wouldn't say better. John Wick 2 was 
excellent. Um, but it looks like Chad Stileski continues to step up his game. And there's talk of making a John Wick TV series that Keanu would produce. So John Wick's going really well for him. But you know what went the best for Keanu Reeves? The Matrix movies. And he made so much money off of those films, $262 million that he can do whatever he wants for the rest of his life. And I think it's great that he's starting to take some risks with that. A lot of the things that Keanu has done is just kind of hang out. He's had some really tough personal breaks, which is I think there are so many sad Keanu pictures. Uh, but, you know, good for him. He keeps going. He's contributed a lot of money to cancer, uh, you know, cancer charities, because, you know, again, he's had some problems in his personal life. Uh, but great guy, and I think this sounds like a really cool idea. And how nice for Alex Winter and that Keanu Reeves, you know, a lot of actors would be like, I don't want to go back, you know. I mean, he's clearly the biggest name attached to this thing, and he's willing to do it, and I think that's fabulous. So that's the first story of the day. Now, the second story of the day is, again, speaking of any someone who can do anything they want right now, that's Jordan Peele as well, at least for the time being. Keanu Reeves can do whatever he wants for the rest of his life because he's set financially. Whereas Jordan Peele is, of course, riding on his Oscar win high. Uh, but you know, I'm sure he's also feeling tremendous pressure uh, that he has to really deliver here. I mean, he's been doing a couple of things. The Twilight Zone show that he's going to produce on CBS All Access, you know, we haven't heard anything about that since it was kind of announced. And then also he did uh, the new, uh, the last OG, the Tracy uh, Morgan, Tiffany Haddish show, show on, uh, I believe, TBS. And no one's really talking about that. So, you know, Jordan Peele really has to deliver a great follow-up to get out if he wants to, you know, cement his status, right? We're going to actually talk about Christopher Nolan a little bit later in this video in the viewer question. And Christopher Nolan is somebody who has, you know, he did enough to cement his status, but he's wavered a little bit in his ability to deliver. And you can see that and re reflected in the, the projects that he has. Dunkirk pretty much went home empty-handed uh, during awards season. And it was, you know, it was created to win awards. It certainly didn't win any big awards. But it, uh, it, it might have actually, I think, did it win cinematography? Uh, no, I don't, uh, I think it might have been Blade Runner, actually. It was a big cinematography win, as I recall. But anyway, Jordan Peele, he's got some work to do. Uh, actually, we are going to be talking about Akira, and Jordan Peele turned down doing Akira, interestingly enough. I hope it was the right move! Instead, he's going to do another personal film that he's writing and directing, again, uh, and it's called Us. I would be a little nervous about that because it instantly reminds me of This Is Us, which of course is a pop culture phenomenon. Uh, Sterling K. Brown made him a household name. Uh, got Mandy Moore and Milo Ventimiglia from Heroes' careers back, uh, back on everyone's radar, so, uh, you know, that I think they kind of have commandeered us for the time being. But anyway, uh, I love the Sterling K. Brown joke from Saturday Night Live when he said uh, the urban version of that would be uh, this us, right? Uh, he, he, Sterling K. Brown's very funny. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's a top secret movie. We don't know anything that it's about. He just released this poster image, which is you know, I don't think is compelling as one would think if that was all you were going to release for a movie. Uh, but Universal and Jason Blum, who's producing again, must feel very good about it because they've given it a March 2019 release date sandwiched right between Captain Marvel and Godzilla 2. Uh, and I think both those movies are, you know, hit or miss, quite frankly. But uh, so Jordan Peele better hope that they're, they're misses. But, you know, Jordan Peele should be competitive as well, especially if he can deliver something on par with what he did with Get Out. But the casting so far is the most exciting thing here. Lupita Nyong'o has landed another role. Just last night we were watching Black Panther Live and in the Q&A someone said, do you think she'll feel bad that Nakia, for instance, wasn't in Infinity War. And I said, you know, Lupita Nyong'o isn't going to feel bad because she's getting so much other work. She is signing so many deals right now. It's raining roles for Lupita. I'm very happy for her because, of course, it was a real dry spell after she won a freaking Oscar, you know, due to the lack of roles for women in color in general in Hollywood, and particularly the, the issue was with colorism and Lupita Nyong'o, of course, having darker skin. Uh, so she's going to star here. That's fabulous. Although I'm sure Letitia Wright and Denai Guerrero were like, we were in... Black Panther 2, and we did a really good job, so why aren't we getting more work? It's just unfortunate. Uh, but again, Lupita's the Oscar winner, so that really helps her when it gets uh, other work, because she brings that to the table. And then, speaking of awards winners, Elizabeth Moss, who's been getting a ton of awards for The Handmaiden's Tale, uh, she is also set to co-star. But the most exciting casting to me, because Lupita's already getting a bunch of stuff, is Winston Duke circling uh, the male lead. Best casting of the group because I really want you know again having watched the film last night he just runs away with his role he's fantastic uh, and he definitely deserves to move forward as well so very exciting I wish that black filmmakers weren't the only ones who are giving black talent work but that's the that's the Hollywood we live in currently uh, hopefully that will uh, change sometime okay like Black Panther's not gonna do it what the heck is 
All right, so the third story of the day is that it's not a great week for Iron Man fans. Well, actually, it's a fabulous week for one because someone stole an old prop suit for Iron Man from a warehouse and the LAPD is looking into it. Hilarious! I mean, it's mostly CGI these days, but I guess at some point they had something someone could walk around in or something that maybe hung, hung in Tony's workshop, right, in the background, and now it's in someone's uh, garage. <laughs> All right, so, uh, but overall, it would seem that Iron Man might actually die in Avengers 4 or at least take a break because Robert Downey Jr.'s uh, non-Marvel schedule is really filling up, and he's the one doing it. Uh, yes, someone really lit a fire under RDJ, and perhaps it's the prospect of no Marvel work in the future, although I'm sure he has tens and hundreds of millions of dollars himself uh, from his lucrative deals. I think he's made the most, probably, off of the Marvel movies, deservedly so, because he kickstarted the whole thing. So, of course, he has the Dr. Doolittle remake coming up, set for 2019, that we all know about, uh, and then he just dated the other day Sherlock Holmes 3 for Christmas 2020. Now this Christmas, there's another uh, Sherlock Holmes movie coming out, Holmes and Watson, where uh, Will Ferrell and John C. Riley play the famous crime-solving duo with Rafe Fiennes as Moriarty. That sounds amazing. I mean, Will Ferrell himself can be hit or miss, so let's see what the trailer looks like, but I think that's obviously going to be a very strong contender if they don't mess it up. And then also, of course, there's always the chance that Sherlock can return on the BBC. So I don't know if there's room for another Sherlock Holmes. We'll see. Uh, Jude Law is also set to return, and I wonder if his role might get a little bit bigger, uh, considering he's now Dumbledore and Marvel. speaking of the Captain Marvel movie. Uh, and he's also the young Pope, although that seems to, have, to not be coming back. He really, I couldn't watch the show. I didn't think it was that great, and I had a little bit of a problem with the Pope. I don't care if he's the young Pope and he smokes and drinks Diet Coke. He has having an awful lot of sex for being the Pope. Uh, and I was like, mm, it's a bit much for me. But I love the, like the one and a half episodes that I did watch, and met, that's all a producer or a casting director needs to see, right? So good for him. But the person who might not return is Guy Ritchie, which I actually think would be a fantastic lucky break for this franchise. Because ironically, for a movie about a detective, both of the first two films they've made in this series have featured absolutely horrendous mysteries that were not well thought out and unsolvable by the audience. You just couldn't play along. It was really just a lot of posturing by uh, Robert Downey Jr. and Jude Law. Uh, it was just like really like an extended comedy sketch uh, that also wasn't that funny either. So. Let's hope that they get some better writers, a better director, uh, and Robert Downey Jr. is the producer, so uh, hopefully somebody has the guts to point out to him for the third time that maybe he might want to invest in having actually a good mystery for Sherlock Holmes, the greatest detective of all time, to solve. Uh, you know, Robert Downey Jr. has proven not to be a great producer with his wife. Their films don't turn out that well. Like the last, I think the last one he did was The Judge, and it was such a colossal failure that he was like, I'm not doing this for a while. <laughs> I have Marvel movies. But now, of course, he doesn't, it seems, and he has to go back to it. But, you know, The Rock eventually got the hang of it, so maybe Robert Downey Jr. can as well. Well, The Rock kind of got the hang of it. Rampage is certainly no Jumanji, but it's better than Baywatch, so he's heading in the right direction. Okay, so the viewer question for today comes from Andrea AJ. And Andrea says, viewer question, please, please, please pick me. Okay, so you got my attention, and then I liked your question. So Andrea says, with Akira being adapted for a live action feature, hopefully someday, uh, Andrea says, I wonder if anime is cursed to fail when translated for Western audiences. It happened to Dragon Ball Evolution, Ghost in the Shell, The Last Airbender, and Death Note. What better source material does Hollywood need? Love your show. I've been watching since you interviewed people outside the Cineplex. Lots of love from Ecuador. Hello, greetings to Ecuador. Hello, Andrea. Great question. And I agree. Uh, anime has some of the best stories possible, and you would think they would just do a straight adaptation. Stop futzing with it, Hollywood! But here's the problem. I think that, well, first, I think that there, well, there's actually just one barrier to anime, uh, but Hollywood believes there are two. So the first legit barrier is animation. Western audiences are, aren't, just aren't interested in adult animation as of yet. Maybe the upcoming uh, Miles Morales animated Spider-Man movie can help change that. Uh, although that, of course, is also directed very strongly at kids. That's very much all ages. But, the, you know, I think often when Western audiences see adult anime, they're like, why isn't this just live action? I see no reason for this to be animated, especially since those audiences don't like the Blade Runner style, um, you know, mise-en-scene, because they don't even like the live action Blade Runner movies, like the literal Blade Runner movies, too. That just has proven not to have a, a very big audience, unfortunately. It has a very strong cult audience, 
but not a, not a large audience, which is what a mainstream movie needs. And if you're going to spend so much money to, to adapt these anime stories, which require a large budget, you, you, you know, I think that they have to change the, um, the ambiance because it's just, it, audiences just don't like it, unfortunately. Because, you know, for instance, um, Blade Runner 2049 and even Ghost in the Shell, you can't get better set design and production design than that. So audiences just don't like it. So it's a hard truth that has to be accepted. So that's a legit barrier. So I would, you know, I would change the settings for these stories. But Hollywood seems to think that a second barrier, this is the fake one, is that these stories are too complex. And they're not. I think that Nolan has proven that Western audiences can really get behind uh, um, a complex story, particularly if they trust the talent that's telling it. So I wish that Christopher Nolan wasn't just set to produce the Akira movie, but would direct it. I think if he were to direct Akira, audiences would be like, I trust you, Nolan. Let's go down this rabbit hole together. And that's his specialty, delivering really complicated stories that maybe or maybe do not make sense. Um, <clears throat> that's a conversation for another day. Uh, but, so he, he was maybe thinking of maybe doing it, directing Akira, but it ultimately decided against it. Maybe he'll change his mind after Dunkirk kind of fizzled. I mean, it did make a lot of money, uh, but it just wasn't, it wasn't on the level of his past hits. And so since I don't think he's ever going to go back to Batman, oh, darn it, maybe he would. I, you know, maybe he should consider that as well. But, you know, I don't really know if it's a good idea to go backward. But to go forward, I think that Akira would be a great opportunity for him. But it doesn't look like he's going to take it. So I think you should uh, change the settings for anime films, uh, you know, when you adapt them to live action. But I would keep the very complex, nuanced stories and don't try to condense them. I think that's problematic. Uh, and then also, you got to have a diverse film. You know, I think, you know, diversity cuts in many different directions. You can't have an entirely Asian cast either if you want it to do well globally. But you can't just put in, like, for instance, I thought Ghost in the Shell was doing it right, only to then see the movie and realize that they sidelined every character that wasn't Scarlett Johansson, um, Bat Batu, uh, and then also the Michael uh, Pitt character. So that's three Caucasian leads, and everyone else was just, like, waved in the background. You know, they had the chief, uh, but his role was, like, not significant, really, either, compared to those three. So I think you have to do, you have to change the ethnicity of some of the characters, but you need one, at least one, preferably two, really strong lead Asian characters. Uh, and I think that then everything would be fine. And also, they, obviously, they made some horrendous story changes that were also offensive in Ghosts in the Shell. Um, and also, the changes, some of the changes in Last Airbender were offensive and that they were just so bad. <laughs> but I think that that's, that's the dilemma. You know? And also, anime is often a series instead of a movie. Uh, so maybe they should be adapting these to the smaller screen. You know, like Akira could maybe be a great um, Westworld type show. But then again, Westworld already exists. So is there space? For Akira. Uh, again, I think Nolan really is the key to making that work and not just producing because he's also proven to be, I think, a pretty bad producer with other people's work, right? I mean, he's the one who shepherded DC in the new direction after he left and that did not work out. Uh, and he's the one who helped pick Zack Snyder. So I just, you know, well, Warner Brothers did too, but I don't think he cared enough to be like, maybe we should pick someone else. Uh, and so I'm not always sympathetic towards Nolan because of how he handled that transition. But I'm curious, why do you think anime doesn't work? If you were a producer in Hollywood, how would you adapt it to Western audiences? Not how you would adapt it to be a dream movie for yourself, but your goal would be actually for it to be successful and for it to make money. What would you do? Uh, write your thoughts down below. Thank you for your question, Andrea. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Please write down below uh, your thoughts on today's uh, top three stories, Andrea's viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, and any questions, of course, that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.